Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to listen to me. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about opportunities for marine byproducts. And as you'll notice from my presentation, uh, the slides that I've got up here that you can see, the products that I'm talking about bear no resemblance to fish. There's nothing fishy at all there except for those rather fabulous shoes. These products are transformational. They're not the sorts of things that you're making now. They're products that are often worth a lot of money and for that reason, a, a philosophy of mine is that the minute that you make something out of a byproduct and it's worth money, it's no longer a byproduct, which is why I have actually changed the title of my presentation to Opportunities for Marine Co-Products. So today I'm going to talk about what are the opportunities for uh, non-fillet marine products, which is what I like to call them. A couple of international examples. This is no mean, in no way covering everything, just a couple that I thought you might find interesting. What's happening in New Zealand at the moment, and how can you get some money if you want to do this stuff yourselves? So, I think that the opportunities fall into about five categories. And of those, there are three main ones based on how much value they can bring into you. We're starting off in the low value area, which is things like silage and fertilizers using mussel shells for driveways. Into the moderate value edible, the moderate value inedible, and then through into the high value ingestibles and the industrials, the area where my team works on the whole. The interesting thing is, if you look at these, um, in New Zealand at the moment, we're really good at rendering. We do a lot of rendering and not the leather. We do a bit in the low value area. We do quite a lot in the um, in high value end. But from my uh, understanding of what's going on, almost nothing in the moderate value edible. Which is interesting because if you look at the technology requirements, that's a sort of lower end. Um, where we could be doing more. Oops. So I'm going to talk about two international models of successful marine products businesses. One of them is Ocean Nutrition Canada, and the other one is Icelandic Cod. So um, fortunately for me, I have a very good collaborative relationship with Colin Barrow at Deakin University. And he was the Vice President of R&D at Ocean Nutrition right through its growth phase from its start through to becoming one of the world's leading suppliers of um, omega-3 products. About four years ago, he moved to Deakin University as Professor of Biotechnology, but he has kept a very weather eye on what's going on there, and he provided me with the information and some of these nice pictures. So the interesting thing about Ocean Nutrition is that it's one company, it's a spin-out of, um, of a fishing company called Clearwater Fine Foods. They started out thinking that they were going to be using fish that was caught around North, uh, North America, but found in the end that there wasn't enough and ended up importing almost all of their raw material and it's made from um, South American anchovies and sardines. The thing that sets Ocean Nutrition apart from a lot of other companies is they have an enormous uh, focus on R&D. They have huge number of scientists, they have the most fantastic laboratories I have ever seen, pilot plants, the whole works. And their whole focus has been on delivering really, really high-tech products, really high-tech processes that they can patent and uh, differentiate their product from other people. One of the most interesting things they do is this very um, sophisticated form of microencapsulation which puts multiple layers around the fish oil, and which means, and then they're very, very tiny particles, so they could even go into uh, clear liquids and into fruit juice and be shelf stable without them ending up t making the product taste of fish. So, in a very short time, Ocean Nutrition became the largest supplier of omega 3 ingredients into the dietary supplements market and the dominant omega 3 supplier worldwide. And these are some of the products that these microencapsulated fish oils are put into. In 2012, ONC was sold for 630 million New Zealand dollars. 
which is now considerably higher valuation than Clearwater Fine Foods. My second case study is the Icelandic cod fishery. We hear quite a lot um, about what's going on and we keep being told we should do something with our byproducts, but I thought this one was interesting because these people actually are and they're seeing a difference. So I think what's most important about this is between 1981 and 2011, they made a lot more money, but they had considerably less fish. And I would like to say that it was entirely due to the byproducts. It wasn't. They changed the whole way they were fishing. So they changed the way they were catching fish and the way they were handling fish. They went into chilled. Really, a lot of emphasis on technology, high quality, uh, high tech processing, high tech vessels. They got much increased productivity from their workers. They're using all of the fish and a real focus on developing new products that were targeted at new markets. And from that well respected scientific source, the Sunday Star Times. I got this nice picture of what the um, Iceland, what they are actually doing with the cod. And you can see from this that from the cod, you take the fillets away and then there's an awful lot of stuff left to do things with. And they are moving right through from cans of caviar and pate, fish stocks, cosmetics. We've got some uh, medical devices, leather, and various omega-3 products that, um, with different applications. So it sounds like they're doing incredibly well. And so here's the rest of the article, and I'm sure that quite a few of you must have seen this also from the Sunday Star Times. And I must admit that you know I've been in this field for quite a long time, and I was, read this and I went, oh, are we really that bad? When Mr. Knudsen is saying, New Zealand's industry is where Iceland's was 30 years ago, and from what I've seen and heard, people are stuck in a box. And I was going, here's all the work that we've been doing and really amounted to nothing. So it was actually a good opportunity for me to have a think about what we're doing and whether we're actually adding value. So are we really stuck in a box? I found this nice picture on the internet, of course, and that's sort of where I see us. We are in a box, I'm sad to say, but we are breaking out and there are limbs flailing everywhere as we are getting our way out of the box and I think we will be out of it soon. We do need to do more. The use of byproducts isn't as widespread across the whole industry, but it is happening. We know that work is underway to revolutionise New Zealand fish harvesting. Eric Barrett is going to talk to you about that later in the day. But from the byproducts end, the heads are being used for cray bait and burley. It's low value, but it's still being used. Skins, liver and roe are exported as products in their own right, or we're using them to make products out of. There's rendering, there's fertiliser. People are starting to find things to do with the shells. We have very good specialist oils and concentrates industry in New Zealand. We're making cartilage powders and chondroitin sulphate. Greenshell mussel is a huge area in the nutraceutical market with quite in-depth clinical trials to show that these things actually work to um, reduce the symptoms of arthritis. Our own work on collagens, we're starting to get products out. Work on undaria, a pest species, we're starting to see products. There's new technology being developed all the time and we are looking at new species. So I decided to plot just a few of the things that we're making around to see what there is and it surprisingly came out looking a lot like the Icelandic version that we had before. The shells are going onto vineyards to act as mulch. Cetone, mussel powder, there's shark cartilage, lipronol, the green shell mussel oil, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. We've got technology, we've got rendering. Seafine, the collagen fining agent that's made by Sea Lord, which is used to fine wine. We've got oils. We've got people who are making small products like kelp uh, salts, and this chap over here who's making a freeze-dried bait for fishing. And our own work in the electrospun nanofibers, which Nathan Guy talked about earlier, and you can see this particularly beautiful electron micrograph 
So these are really fine fibres which have been uh, spun out of hokey collagen that's been extracted and are going onto the air conditioning units used by Revolution Fibres. So I'd like to say we can get more value. We are getting more value. We've got so many opportunities to do this and do it well. We've got a huge range of marine organisms. The um, Icelandic case study is all on cod. We've got a lot of large volume species that we can um, exploit. We have very high quality raw materials. We have raw material suppliers, processes and marketers already in place. They may not be selling these products, but they could. We have really great research and technical skills, I had to say that, but in the universities and the Crown Research Institutes, but also in the companies that I work with. We have and we are developing the technology. There's lots of funding for research out there if you want to do this work. Best of all, consumers want natural products. The, current, the market is worth billions of dollars worldwide and we should be getting more of that share. The New Zealand brand has been a little bit hammered lately, but it's still fabulous. We, the product, our products are high quality, they're safe, they're sustainable, and we have a great story. And we have a fantastic model to work from in this space, from the dairy industry. So as I see it, to make this work, we actually have to work together, which is a little bit of a change from how things have done in the past. It's expensive doing this sort of work and you need a lot of infrastructure, but the infrastructure is already there. So as I see it, we've got the seafood industry, we've got people who already have the equipment to make these kinds of products, we have people who can make them into things, put them in pills, make them into air conditioning filters, and we have the marketing all held together by some excellent R&D. So just to show you that I actually do some real work sometimes, um, this is a picture of our pilot plant in Nelson and you can see from this we really do this work, we really make these products. I'm particularly passionate about it and fortunately for me so is Plant and Food and they have invested quite a lot of money in this um, fantastic factory that we have. If anyone wants to make products you can come and use it. There is lots of funding. Plant and Food is putting more than two million dollars of core funding into seafood research um, in this, this year. There's a brochure, I was told I had to show you this, you'll be getting one of these later, which will show you um, what sort of research that we're doing. If you feel that you have ideas that you would like us to pursue, come and see us. Um, my own MBIE program, I say mine, it's not really, it's our team's MBIE program, Export Marine Products, which has just been funded in the latest funding round, is all about developing high value marine products for export. Seafood Innovations has money. There are business development grants through Callaghan Innovation. And there's another MBIE program, which I'm also involved in, called the Bioprocessing Bioresource Processing Alliance. Bit of a mouthful. There's all these options. If you want to do some work, if you want to find out more about how to do work, or if you're just interested in finding out more about what we do, come and see me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.